So I'm Katie, I'm a systems designer here at GitHub. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm wearing a dark gray GitHub t-shirt tonight. So here I am, just a few months ago, hovering over that green merge button on a huge pull request. This is something my team had been working on for many, many months, and it contained a major release with some breaking changes. All the checks were passing, my team had approved it, it was ready to go. But I still wondered, did we make the right decisions? Are these changes actually going to work for everyone? I'm sure many of you have had a similar experience to this. But I pressed the button. And no one really noticed. But for this kind of work, that's actually a really great thing. Today I'm here to talk to you about invisible infrastructure. So what is invisible infrastructure? As systems designers, we provide and maintain the infrastructure that others use to build GitHub. We think about the common patterns and interactions that most people just really don't want to worry about. Our goal is to make other product teams more efficient without ever getting in their way. We're not really trying to impress anyone most of the time. We're just trying to make sure everything works. And if it works, no one pays attention to it. We're kind of like CSS janitors. We're constantly working to keep things clean and functional, and you don't ever really think about us until something breaks. So with that in mind, let's talk about Primer design tokens. Primer is the design system powering GitHub. It's made up of several libraries spanning Figma, CSS, Rails, React, and Brand. Our design tokens, also called Primer primitives, contain color, sizing, and typography values. Back in 2020, GitHub shipped dark mode, which is a huge undertaking for the Primer team. And it worked really well. It was a huge success. I'm sure many of you remember when this happened. But after a while, we found inconsistencies with how colors were actually being used within the UI. And as we continued to add new components and features, we struggled to extend that system that was in place. Designers were having trouble picking colors, and we were having trouble naming them. The same color had a unique name across all primer surface areas, like Figma, CSS variables, and CSS classes. And our designers felt the names themselves were inconsistent and difficult to predict as they were working. So we sought out to address these issues by designing an entirely new naming convention. This meant we had to change 340 color token names, all while new code and design was going out every day. So when it came to adoption, we did the bulk of the work for product teams. The goal was for teams to continue shipping without missing a beat, even as color names were changing. But before we could ship it, we had to do the work. And naming things is like no big deal, right? That's, that's like a really simple process. It shouldn't take that long. It shouldn't feel chaotic or stressful at all, no? So six months later, we had established a new naming convention. It worked for all 340 color tokens. And there's room to grow as we add new colors. Our new convention forces every color to follow a similar structure. The names are more predictable, but also offer flexibility to handle things like state and other variations. To help designers know when to use specific colors, we introduced a property value into every color name. Property values map back to CSS properties, like background color or border color, and we enforce this rule in both code and Figma. In Figma, we use that property value to limit the color choices based on the type of object you have selected. So if you select a text node, you'll only see foreground colors available to use. Another benefit of having a property value is that it makes accessibility testing much easier. In our primitives repository, we have a workflow that runs on all of our PRs, checking the contrast ratio between specific values. This helps us hold ourselves accountable to meet our accessibility standards, especially as we continue to add new colors. With this new system, color names are the same across all primary surface areas. So now when you jump between Figma and code, the color name translates perfectly, which is perfect because many designers at GitHub are doing this daily. We also wanted to reduce confusion with some of the descriptive terminology we were using. 
Words like muted and subtle technically mean the same thing, and we found they were used interchangeably throughout the UI. So that means it's a great opportunity to flatten and reduce options. We love reducing options in design systems. And when it comes to colors, having less options can help increase the quality of our designs. We decided to move forward with a single muted value for all of our functional color tokens. Another example of how we achieved that seamless rollout was through our build process. There's a few steps in between defining design tokens and consuming them, and that's what we call the build process. The naming convention is really part of defining design tokens, and we can codify that with tooling. On the left here, you'll see how our tokens look in JSON format, and on the right, how they compile down into CSS variables. By reworking our tooling, we were also able to introduce support for Figma variables. We did this by exporting special metadata unique to all of our color tokens. We consumed that Figma metadata with a custom plugin built by my colleague, Lucas Opperman. Shout out, Lucas, he couldn't be here tonight. This plugin lets us import specific tokens from our GitHub repository that we ship as part of Primer Web. If you want to see more about this and how we connect code to Figma or anything about design tokens, um, come check out our demo station later tonight. Figma launched variables right around the time we had planned to actually ship these new colors as styles. So we leveraged that excitement by instead shipping the new colors as variables, exposing designers to the new convention early. This gave them extra time to familiarize and stress test colors before we actually shipped to GitHub. So the final boss we had to defeat here was actually shipping this thing. Remember that image of me pressing the button? This was the true test of whether or not we could make this a smooth and uneventful transition. From the very beginning, we kept track of how old token names would map to the new names. A lot of the basic structure of how we theme at GitHub remained the same, so it really became a matter of mass find and replace. Since we had that replacement information, we used it to build code mods. These code mods would replace the old color variables with the new variables and leave the old variable in place as a fallback value. We then ran a test that served the new color variables if the feature was enabled or the old if it was disabled. And this reduced the risk for bugs and allowed us to test these colors in production slowly over time. This practice of using code mods and tests to ship CSS updates has been around for a while at GitHub. And because of that, hubbers are familiar with the process, which helped lead to a very sm smooth rollout. We left those code mods in place, so if someone used an old color, we could inform them of the new one and often even auto-fix it for them. So even though I opened hundred, hundreds of PRs uh, updating these colors everywhere throughout GitHub, I didn't have to worry about keeping up with new code that was introduced as the test was running. Having this tooling in place also provided a nice teaching moment where people could learn about the new colors as they work and get used to them at their own pace. So let's recap on how we solved this naming problem. We designed a naming convention. We connected code to Figma variables, and we shipped it in a way that required little to no effort from product teams. And we did all this without breaking GitHub. We never got in anyone's way. We just quietly handed teams these new and improved tools to better communicate across their domains. We're helping prevent future accessibility and design debt, and with these changes, designers can focus on much bigger and better things than whether or not they chose the right color for their UI. This isn't the kind of work that gets a lot of attention normally. This is my first time talking about it publicly. <laughs> invisible infrastructure is just that, invisible. But that makes it no less valuable than any other work that needs to get done. So the next time your workday feels just a little bit smoother, Maybe you'll think of us and the invisible infrastructure that made it possible. Thanks.